Uh, the one brain area that I want to especially uh, devote time to is the hypothalamus of the brain. And we had described previously that it's the center of homeostasis, which is the most important word in the physiology course. Um, the uh, hypothalamus, of course, is called that because it's located below, below hypo, below the thalamus. Uh, the hypothalamus, we wrote, is linked to the pituitary gland by both nerve fiber tracts and by a profuse network of blood vessels, of capillaries. So there are a bunch of nerve, tra nerve fibers going between, this is the hypothalamus and this is the pituitary gland, and there's also a bunch of blood vessels that are collectively known as the hypothalamic pituitary portal system that we'll be talking about. Um, what uh, what uh, are some of the main functions uh, of the hypothalamus of the brain? So on the next page, on 124, so what are the functions of the hypothalamus? So there are some very important control centers, reflex centers. And the first one we've mentioned, you all know, the thermoregulatory reflex center. Its job is to maintain, to regulate the temperature of our body at about 37 degrees centigrade or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And we've learned quite a bit about that back in section C of our lecture outline when we talked about temperature regulation. Uh, also in the hypothalamus is a control center that regulates our blood sugar level. And the normal blood sugar level is about 100 milligrams of glucose per deciliter of blood. Since we've been tested, uh, had a lab test on units, you should understand what that means. And incidentally, it doesn't matter if I say 100 milligrams of glucose per deciliter or 100 milligrams of glucose per 100 milliliters. 100 milliliters is the same as a tenth of a liter, a deciliter. Or I could say it's 100 milligrams percent, because percent means per 100 milliliters. So all that means the same thing. You, you might say, like, do we have to know that for the next test, the uh, third test? Yes. You'll need to know what a normal blood sugar level is. Uh, now, this control center is commonly called the appetite satiety reflex center. And uh, you'd say, well, like, what do those mean? Well, appetite means a physiological drive to eat to raise your blood sugar level. And then uh, when you no longer, uh, once your blood sugar level, you raise it up to that normal value, the set point, so then your uh, physiologic drive to eat goes away uh, to uh, raise that blood sugar level. And so we say you're satisfied, you are satiated, or satiety. So the satiety is to be satiated or satisfied. Now, I might just point out that uh, there's, uh, there's uh, two terms that are used relating to eating, and one's used in physiology and the other's in, used in psychology. The physiological drive to eat to raise your blood sugar level is called appetite. The psychological desire to eat just because you feel like eating is called hunger. So in other words, just to kind of use these terms using me as the example, at this moment, I do not have an appetite, but I'm always hungry. Mm -hmm. If somebody walks in carrying a slice of pizza, do I have an appetite right now that I've got to eat to raise my blood sugar level? No. But I look at that slice of pizza, it looks pretty good, it smells good. Yeah, I'll eat it. All right, so being hungry all the time is a psychological craving. And that's different than the physiological drive to raise your blood sugar level. Um, anyhow, that's the control center. Also in the hypothalamus is a thirst reflex center, more properly called the osmoregulatory reflex center. Its job is to maintain the tonicity of our body fluids at 300 milliosmolar. Certainly we've learned about that. That's called isotonic. So in, we're going to talk about, more about this center very shortly, but the idea is that if you uh, had, uh, let's say you ate up a lot of salty food, 
right? You had a lot of salted peanuts, salted potato chips, salted pistachios, you ate a bunch of pickles, you get the idea. Salted popcorn, salted popcorn. <laughs> All right, so then as you absorb that salt into your bloodstream and your body fluids, can you see that you've made yourself a little bit hypertonic? You've added more solute to the fluid that you've got. So that's probably gonna cause you to want to drink that water that's right there because you've eaten all that salt to dilute that salt and return you back to being isotonic. In fact, this control, and I might just point out when we say hypertonic, uh, that means more solute, that, uh, uh, the proportion of solute to water is too high, too much solute relative to the amount of water. It doesn't have to be too much salt necessarily, it could be any solute. If you ate a lot, a lot of sugar, you might make, become thirsty because you've just eaten too much solute. Whether it's salt or whether it's sugar, you have a desire now to drink water. On the other hand, if you had drunk a lot, a lot of water, a lot of fluid, you might actually have the opposite physiological drive to eat something salty, right? To bring you back to being isotonic. So we know that we get this physiological drive. Uh, I'll use the word craving, even though that's really psychological. This is physiological, coming from our hypothalamus, where we feel we need to drink or we feel we need salt. Uh, and that's to be isotonic. This is very, very important. You'd say, why is it important? We've already learned that if the uh, cells of our body, think of especially our brain cells, are exposed to a hypotonic fluid, the water starts to flow into the cells and the cells, including our brain cells, start to swell and they may burst. That would be pretty dangerous. Conversely, if the cells, our brain cells, are exposed to fluid, let's say cerebrospinal fluid that's too hypertonic, then the water in our cells starts to go out of the cells and our cells, including our brain cells, start to collapse. That's called crenation. So these are extremely dangerous. So maintaining the tonicity of our body fluids is physiologically very important. Did, did you have a question? Okay, so um, now, not only does our hypothalamus have these control centers, but we wrote next that it modulates, it can adjust the activity of control centers lower down in our brain or even in our spinal cord. So we had mentioned uh, previously that we have a cardiovascular reflex center in the medulla oblongata, but the hypothalamus can send signals uh, down to the control centers in the uh, medulla oblongata. This diagram on page 108 will remind us that we showed an arrow indicating that signals in the hypothalamus can affect activity of control centers in the medulla oblongata, such as the cardiovascular reflex center. Um, and also, in the medulla oblongata is a vomiting reflex center, we've mentioned, and a swallowing. So these, uh, the hypothalamus can affect these control centers in the medulla oblongata. In our spinal cord, we have a micturition reflex center and a defecation reflex center. And if you're thinking, well, like, what are those? Would it help if I said number one and number two? All right, so in our spinal cord, there's a control center that affects whether we feel we need to pee or do the other thing. And um, uh, the, the peeing or urinating is also known as micturition. Uh, and this is influenced by signals sent from the hypothalamus down to these lower control centers in our spinal cord. Okay, in addition, letter C, our hypothalamus adjusts the activity of our various visceral organs to match the physical activity and energy requirements of the person. Uh, so th this is... This is, of course, what we were dealing with when we said that the hypothalamus is the highest control center over the autonomic motor neurons. The function of our autonomic motor neurons, the parasympathetic and sympathetic, is to speed up, to power up or power down the different part organs, the internal or visceral organs of our body, so that we meet the energy demands that we have at that moment. This is the essence of homeostasis. If you start to, if you want to exercise and start running, then your hypothalamus 
using your sympathetic autonomic motor neurons, powers up the heart and uh, uh, opens up the airways, uh, dilates the blood vessels to our skeletal muscles to allow you to do that while powering down the stomach and, and kidneys, as we've learned. Conversely, you sit down for a nice meal, you're relaxed. So the hypothalamus is the master control activating the parasympathetics to uh, uh, power up and power down those appropriate organs of the body for sitting and relaxing and eating a nice meal. Power down the heart, power up the salivary glands. So uh, that's the essence of homeostasis. That's the hypothalamus. And then what I wrote next is that our hypothalamus secretes two hormones. Now, the hypothalamus is made up of neurons. So when we say that these neurons are releasing chemicals into the bloodstream, hormones, these are neurotransmitter hormones. This is similar to how we've already learned how sympathetic postganglionic motor neurons in the adrenal medulla release adrenaline, epinephrine, into the bloodstream. That's a neurotransmitter, right? A chemical released by neurons that's released into the bloodstream, circulates in the bloodstream, and acts as a hormone. And at the time that I mentioned epinephrine adrenaline, I said that's not the only place. It, there's a lot of that. And there's, here's an exa another example. Now, uh, who are these two uh, neurotransmitter hormones? They were uh, identified in the 1950s, and uh, one of them is called antidiuretic hormone, abbreviated ADH, also known as vasopressin. And uh, the other one, uh, identified on page uh, 126, at the bottom half of 126, is known as oxytocin, which is available uh, uh, as a synthetic under the brand name Pitocin. Now, to help us understand this, let's look at our picture on 127. 127. And uh, I've kind of colored my picture in. And you're thinking, yeah, your picture's really nice. It's colored in. My picture doesn't look like that. Well, number one, you could color your picture in, too. Or number two, I want to remind you, you have beautiful colored pictures in your book. So you've got lots of color pictures. Uh, what are we looking at? This is the hypothalamus up here. And these are some hypothalamic neurons. But let's focus on this right here. This is the pituitary gland, which is attached to the hypothalamus. Now, we have reminded you right here that the pituitary gland is also known as the hypothesis. So whether you've ever heard that term before, or not, you are now. Now, the pituitary gland, or hypothesis, is divided into two lobes, two parts. A anterior, which means front lobe, and a posterior, or back lobe, to the pituitary. Anterior and posterior. So we wrote that right here. This is the anterior pituitary, and this is the posterior, or all right, posterior pituitary. Now, the posterior pituitary is also known as the neural hypothesis, the neural part of the pituitary gland. And the reason why it's called that is because, if you notice, it shows that there are neurons in the hypothalamus up here whose axons extend down into this part of the pituitary gland. So this is really just a continuation of the hypothalamus of the brain. That's why it's called the neural hypothesis. And as we're going to see, these neurons release neurotransmitters from their synaptic knobs. But these neurotransmitters are released from the synaptic knobs into the bloodstream. They enter the bloodstream. So they are going to circulate in the bloodstream like hormones. And the name of these two neurotransmitter hormones are ADH, which is the abbreviation for antidiuretic hormone. And the other is oxytocin, which circulate in the bloodstream. So we're going to be learning more about those. But let's just uh, look at the other half of the pituitary gland or hypothesis. 
Now, this half of the pituitary is known as the anterior lobe or the adenohypophysis. Does anybody know what adeno means? All right. Now, it's hard to read. Is that, huh? Anybody know? Okay. You do know? No. No. Anterior means anterior. Adeno is a different word. All right. Now, no. All right. Now, if you had me for anatomy, it's on page A4 of my anatomy lecture outline. Page A4. I know it's hard to remember everything. Adeno means gland. And adenoma is a tumor in a gland. I give that example in anatomy, page A4. But anyhow, so it means a gland. This is a true gland. It, and like all glands, it is made up characteristically of cuboidal epithelial cells. And these cuboidal-shaped epithelial cells secrete a whole bunch of different hormones into the bloodstream. They are labeled here secretory cells. They secrete hormones into the bloodstream. What are the hormones that these cells of the adenohypophysis secrete? Uh, GH, TSH, ACTH, FSH, LH, and prolactin. We're going to be learning about all of these. So this is a true gland. The neurohypophysis is really just, these are axons of neurons, but they are releasing neurotransmitters called ADH and oxytocin that enter the bloodstream. They are neurotransmitter hormones. Now, I want to focus on the neurohypophysis and ADH and oxytocin for the moment. Let's look at where these neurons originate. Now, we, I, I drew, there's two neurons depicted here. I colored one of them uh, green and the other yellow. They're, they're of course, if you're thinking, wow, I forgot to bring my green colored pencil today, that's okay. They're not really green and they're not really yellow. And there's not just one of each. There are thousands of each of these two types. I, we're just representing these two different types of neurons by two different colors, but there are thousands of each. Now, the, uh, the green one, the green one is a neuron that is located in this part of the hypothalamus and the books call that area the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus. Don't even bother writing it down. Okay, they call it the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus or the supraoptic nucleus of the... Uh, the trouble with those words that they use in the books is that those words don't mean anything to us. So we're going to use a terminology that's more descriptive of what it, it, the, uh, this brain area does. We're going to call this area of the hypothalamus the osmoregulatory or thirst reflex center. And yes, we just mentioned it a few minutes ago. So this is where the thirst reflex center is, or osmoregulatory reflex center that regulates the tonicity of our body fluids. We're going to be learning that these neurons, when activated, conduct, can, can conduct action potentials down their length and release ADH into the bloodstream. Now, what did we say ADH stands for? Anti-diuretic hormone. Does anybody remember what a diuretic is? Yes, a diuretic makes you pee, makes you excrete urine. So this is called anti-diuretic. It prevents you from urinating. It prevents you from peeing, anti-diuretic. Uh, the, uh, the other neuron in yellow, the way I've drawn it here, uh, again, the, the, the books will give it a fancy anatomic term, uh, complex series of words as far as this brain center in the hypothalamus. We're going to call it, instead of calling it the uh, paraventricular nucleus of the or a supraoptic nucleus, we're going to call it the parturition milk letdown reflex center. Now, our first thought is that doesn't sound any better than the other term. But, <laughs> but if we understand what these words mean, it will. Does anybody know what parturition means? Childbirth. Parturition means childbirth. This is the control center that initiates childbirth and labor contractions. And not only does it initiate childbirth, it initiates what we call milk letdown. Milk letdown is the expression that's used for when milk starts to come out of the breast. Okay, That's called milk letdown. So this control center is involved in both. And in fact, uh, when it's activated, it sends uh, action potentials down these neurons 
that you, here in the neurohypothesis, they release oxytocin into the bloodstream. And that oxytocin circulates in the bloodstream, and it's going to affect, as we're going to see, the uterus, uh, causing it to contract, and also affects the mammary glands and causes them to start squirting out uh, whatever fluid is in the mammary glands. Now, just as a, a one thought we can ask ourselves, if these uh, chemicals are entering the bloodstream and they're going everywhere in the body, uh, how come they would just affect, why would oxytocin just affect uh, the uterus and the mammary glands and not affect uh, the heart? Because the receptor sites, the oxytocin receptor sites, are in the uterus, cells of the uterus and the cells of the mammary glands and not in heart cells or in stomach cells. So that's that old story. The receptor sites on the surface of the cell determines which cells respond or are affected by which chemicals circulating in our bloodstream. So uh, that's, that's a long time story. Let's uh, analyze this more. Let's go back to page uh, 125, on 125. And in the middle of page 125, so we want to first deal with the osmoregulatory or thirst reflex center that releases antidiuretic hormone or ADH. Now, we've represented this control center in our hypothalamus using a box diagram. This is not the first time we've used box diagrams. We originally did this in section C when we showed you how we were going to, going to describe a homeostatic reflex. And you might remember we said we have these control centers, mostly in our brain. And their job is to maintain a set point, to maintain some condition of our body constant. The function of the osmoregulatory reflex center is to keep the tonicity of our body fluids isotonic at about 300 milliosmolar. <clears throat> this is similar to how we have a temperature control center in the hypothalamus that tries to maintain our body temperature at 37 degrees centigrade. We had learned when we talked about the temperature control center in section C, we said that if a control center is going to regulate anything. It needs to know in real time what is that, what's happening to that condition that it's trying to regulate at this moment. So we learn that the temperature control center gets information from thermoreceptors that provide it with information as to what your actual body temperature is in that moment. And then it compares your actual body temperature with the desired set point. And if they match, everything's perfect. Similarly, the osmoregulatory reflex center, if its job is to regulate the tonicity of our body fluids, it needs to know in real time what is the tonicity of our body fluids. So there are sensory neurons called osmoreceptors that are continuously sending information to it along a sensory pathway. And so it gets the information and it simply compares. Remember, I wrote the word compares back in section C. It compares. What is the tonicity at this moment versus the desired tonicity? And if they match, everything's perfect. If they don't match, if the tonicity is either more hypertonic or a hypotonic, then this control center has to send signals down a motor pathway to do something to compensate and return that condition back to the desired level. Now, before we analyze this further, have we ever mentioned osmoreceptors previously? The answer is yes. And just to remind you, because it actually goes back to information you need to know for the uh, second exam, it was on page 78. On page 78, we were learning on page 78 about visceral sensory neurons or interoceptors, and among them were osmoreceptors. They're right there on page 78. Those are sensory neurons that monitor the tonicity of our body fluids. So uh, that information doesn't reach consciousness. They're visceral sensory neurons, but that's where we first mentioned them. <clears throat> All right, so let's see uh, how this uh, works, this control center. And it works just like all the other control centers. Incidentally, we're going to see this involves what's known as a negative feedback loop 
This whole concept of homeostatic reflexes and negative feedback loops is described over five pages in chapter one of your book. I had mentioned many times, if you read only one chapter in the book, read those five pages in chapter one about homeostasis and a negative feedback response. Because if you don't have that idea down, you should retake physiology. You've missed the entire point of this course. Okay, it's covered in the first chapter. That's how fundamental it is. All right, so let's imagine that you ate some salted popcorn. We won't name names, all right? Or you had salted pistachios or pickles or something salty. And you absorb that salt into your bloodstream, into your body fluids, and that makes you more hypertonic. Well, this information is being sent to this control center in the hypothalamus of your brain that we call the osmoregulatory or thirst reflex center. When it uh, sees that the tonicity of your body fluids has become a more salty, hypertonic than the desired 300 milliosmolar, it has to act, respond to compensate. And it does in two ways. Number one, all of a sudden you start to feel thirsty. So when, if you eat a bunch of salty food, I promise you, at a certain point, you're going to feel thirsty. And the second thing it does, besides causing you to feel thirsty, is that these neurons start to release ADH into the bloodstream. Now again, let's remind ourselves, uh, how does it release that uh, ADH into the bloodstream? So we saw on page 127, so here's these neurons. They send action potentials down their length. And here in the neural hypothesis, uh, they release ADH from the synaptic knobs and it enters the bloodstream. Now this ADH is circulating in the bloodstream, but it specifically affects the kidneys. So why would ADH specifically affect the kidneys? Because that's where the ADH receptor sites are. Does that make sense? So uh, the, uh, and what does it cause the kidneys to do? Well, what's the name of this ADH? What does ADH stand for? Antidiuretic hormone. It prevents the kidneys from excreting a lot of water. So instead of excreting water, the kidneys retain water. So if you've just eaten a bunch of salt, salted foods, and you start to feel thirsty and start drinking water, and in, in contrast to normally, if you drank a lot of water, you'd pee it out, you're going to retain that water. Aren't you now going to drink water and retain it, which should uh, dilute that salt in a greater volume of fluid, lowering the tonicity back down to isotonic? Does everybody follow that? You've added water to your body fluids. You're retaining it, you're not peeing it out and you're diluting whatever salt is in your body fluids in a greater volume of fluid. That returns you back to being isotonic. All right. This also explains something else that you've all heard of. You have heard that if you eat salt, you retain water. You ever heard that? This is the mechanism. Now, the most critical thing was to get you back to being isotonic. Because the danger of being hypertonic is that the water in your cells would start to go out of the cells and they'd start to collapse. We don't want that, especially your brain cells. So we had to get you back to being isotonic. This is the mechanism. Once you're isotonic, then over the next couple of days, several days, your kidneys can then start to excrete that excess salt and the excess water that you retain but it had to immediately get you back to being isotonic. That had to be done immediately because of the consequences of cells either swelling up and bursting or collapsing. Neither one is good if you're hypertonic or hypotonic. Another way of showing the uh, same thing, uh, and incidentally here we wrote that the osmoregulatory reflex center is what regulates salt and water balance, maintaining the tonicity of our body fluids by controlling thirst and urine output. Here in this diagram, it shows the same thing. A little bit more. Imagine our blood becomes hypertonic. You'd say, why? Because you ate a bunch of salty foods. Or 
Maybe you didn't eat a lot of salt. Maybe you haven't been eating a lot of salt. But you haven't had anything to drink all day long. And your body fluids are becoming hypertonic because we lose water. We sweat water, and we lose water every time we exhale. And if you don't drink water to replace the water you're losing from your body, you are becoming hypertonic. So whether you ate salt and became hypertonic, or you just haven't been replacing the water you're losing. So in any case, we know that you're going to feel thirsty. And you're going to release ADH, which is going to cause the kidneys to retain water. Once you retain enough water and dilute that uh, salt to back to being isotonic, once you're isotonic, it shuts off the mechanism. That's a negative feedback loop. And the whole mechanism was just to get you back to being where you're supposed to be, the desired set point. This is just like in the temperature regulation, so if you become overheated, right? So you sweat to cool you down, and you keep sweating until you cool down to your right temperature, and then the sweating stops. You don't keep sweating once you're back to normal temperature. The mechanism shuts off. You know, an example of a, of a device, uh, an apparatus that's in all of our homes that uses a negative feedback uh, mechanism is your toilet. You flush the toilet, the water level in the tank goes down. And water starts filling up the tank. And the water keeps filling up the tank until it reaches the let set level, and it shuts off so it doesn't overflow. That's a negative feedback response. You flush the toilet again, the water goes down, return on the water. Let's refill it up, get it back to where it's supposed to be. All right, so this is a negative feedback response. The idea is to maintain something constant. That's a homeostatic reflex. Now, um, at the uh, bottom of the page, it uh, actually shows, we, you don't have to know this, but it actually shows the chemical structure of antidiuretic hormone, ADH. It's actually made up of eight amino acids. It's a short polypeptide is what it is. And I only point this out because shown right next to it is this, the amino acid, the polypeptide, called oxytocin. Oxytocin is the neurotransmitter hormone that's going to cause labor contractions. And there's only a difference of two amino acids between ADH and oxytocin. You don't have to know that. But just these slight differences in the chemical structure of these two chemicals has a profoundly different effect on the body between causing a woman to go into labor and uh, affecting the kidneys so that they retain water. Let's summarize uh, what ADH does by looking on page 134A. 134A. And on page 134A is the first of many, many pages, if you actually start to see what follows, that are charts of hormones that we're going to be learning. This one. So on 134A, So we're focusing on the first one, antidiuretic hormone, ADH. And where does it come from? What's its source? It is being released from the neurohypophysis, also known as the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. And what does ADH do? It causes our kidneys to retain water. Antidiuretic prevents diuresis. So it's, by retaining water, you excrete just small volumes of urine. Incidentally, this idea of how much water we, how much uh, we volume of urine we excrete, the whole idea is it reflects whether we uh, are, need water in our body or whether we have too much water. So we've just been describing that if you, don't, if you need more water, 
So you're just going to, you're going to take the same waste products you would have excreted, but you're going to excrete them in a smaller volume of urine. So your urine's going to look darker in color, more yellow, because you're taking all the same waste products and concentrating them in a smaller volume. On the other hand, if you started drinking a lot, a lot of water, you'd start peeing a lot more, because you drink too much water, too much fluid. And you'll notice that the urine, the color of the urine, is more clear. It's the same waste products you're excreting, but now they're diluted in a bigger volume of fluid. So that's why it looks more clear and less yet dark yellow. So the coloration is a reflection of, uh, you know, those same waste products diluted in either a smaller volume or a greater volume of fluid. So we're just talking about affecting the water you're getting rid of, not the waste products. It has no effect on that. Um, the whole idea is to maintain the tonicity at 300 milliosmolar. And the most important fluid to make sure it stays at 300 milliosmolar is the CSF, the cerebrospinal fluid surrounding our brain and spinal cord. Because the last cells that we want to either start swelling up or, bur uh, or, or collapsing, crenating, are our brain cells. So that's really its most critical job, is to maintain uh, the tonicity of those body fluids. Now, in this course, I'm going to be telling you, as we cover the hormones, I'm going to be focusing on one or two major actions of these hormones. It's all more complicated. Hormones have a multiplicity of effects on the body, not just one or two. So I'm going to usually just focus on one or two actions, and, but you should understand they have many other actions. I'm not going to test you on this, but ADH not only affects the kidneys, it causes your kidneys to retain water, it decreases sweating. Now, it's, I won't test you on this, but it makes sense. If you're short on water, you don't want to lose a lot of water by sweating. So it actually reduces the amount of water you would sweat, because you've got to retain water. So you're going to re excrete less water in your urine. You're going to excrete less water in as sweat. So it certainly makes sense. It's trying to maintain the tonicity, retain water. It has another action, which I'm not going to attempt to explain. Uh, I could, but I'm not. It causes blood vessels to constrict. I'm not testing you on that, but that explains why another name for ADH is vasopressin. It pre increases the pressure of the, in their vessels by constricting them. So again, I'm not going to get into that, but it has other actions. Now, what we listed next are so what are the factors that stimulate, what are the factors that cause ADH to be released? Answer, increased tonicity of our body fluids. We're too salty. And what are the factors that would reduce, decrease its release? The opposite. If we're, our tonicity of our body fluids is too low, we're hypotonic. It makes sense. The, the idea is how much ADH you release depends upon are you hypotonic or hypertonic. The idea is you've got to release whatever you need to get you back to isotonic. So we, that adjusts how much water you're going to pee out. So the whole idea is just to get you back to normal. All right, so that's a summary of ADH. Okay, let's take a look on page 126. And on 126, if we look below the picture, okay, page 126. Oxytocin, which is available as a synthetic medicine called Pitocin, some of you may have heard of. Oxytocin has two major actions. It stimulates the dilation, the widening of the lower part of the uterus called the cervix. It causes the lower part of the cervix to dilate, the opening of the uterus, and initiates contractions of the uterus during parturition. Parturition is the clinical word for childbirth. So this is what initiates labor contractions. Secondly, it stimulates milk letdown during nursing. 
So oxytocin not only affects the uterus, but affects the mammary glands and causes whatever fluid is in the mammary glands to squirt out. That's called milk letdown. Now, we wrote that oxytocin is released in response to what's known as a neuroendocrine reflex, which we'll be explaining. And number four, we wrote oxytocin has no actions or functions in guys. <laughs> because the oxytocin receptor sites are on the uterus and on the mammary glands. And last time I checked, guys don't have a uterus or mammary glands. So even if you injected them with oxytocin, it wouldn't have any place where it would activate anything. So it really has no action in guys. A very bizarre thing about the way oxytocin works is unlike almost everything else in the body, it follows a positive feedback response rather than a negative feedback response. And I'm going to explain this, but it was explained in those five pages in chapter one, where it summarized both negative and positive feedback. So we'll explain that. Uh, let's focus on labor contractions first. So we're going to look at the picture on the uh, upper right. <clears throat> All right, and I want to speak br briefly about basically where the baby is during pregnancy. Now, during pregnancy, for the first seven months, most women, most, are carrying their baby lot oriented horizontally in the womb. Baby is oriented horizontally in the womb. Around the seventh month of pregnancy, most of the time, in around the seventh month, the baby starts to, on its own, rotate into the head down position. That's around the seventh month. That is commonly known as cephalic presentation. That means head comes out first. Cephalic means head. The baby's going to be born head first out, the vaginal or birth canal. As we look, incidentally, at this vaginal canal, we're wondering, yeah, how's that going to work? But anyhow, uh, that's, the baby's got to come out through that vaginal or birth canal. And who designed that? OK, so uh, now, that usually, the baby usually rotates into the head down position. I call it the blast off position. OK, but they'll call it cephalic presentation. Now, sometimes the baby does not go into the blast off position. And therefore, it's, it's, uh, they say it's in the breach presentation. It's breach. That almost always means they're going to do a C-section. Because if, they, if the head's not going to come out first, if the baby is still, if it's a possibility that the feet might come out first, or they're going to have to tug on something. Uh, in the old days, they literally used to pull on an arm, or pull on a leg, or try to grab onto something. Now they don't do that. They're going to do an abdominal incision and deliver it by what's called C-section, cesarean delivery. So that's one of the most more common reasons of why they, they might have to do a C-section. There are many reasons. All right. <clears throat> now, uh, we've described how the baby goes into this blast-off position about seven months. So, you know, most women in their seventh month, they're kind of carrying the baby kind of like this, right? Just sticking out. About two weeks before the birth of the baby, the baby drops. And all of a sudden, the woman is carrying that baby much lower down than she had been. Everybody relate to that? OK, so the baby had been like this, and now all of a sudden, it's much lower. The head of the baby drops to the bottom of the uterus, called the cervix. We, the term they use, it's engaged. Engagement is occurring. Now, as the head of the baby pushes against the lower wall of the uterus, the cervix, there are sensory neurons in the wall of the uterus. They are like pressure receptors. And they are activated by the pressure of the baby's head against that lower wall of the uterus. And that initiates action potentials in this sensory neuron. So they start sending these signals, these impulses, up, up, up to the hypothalamus of the brain. They are sending those signals to that area of the hypothalamus that we've called the parturition milk letdown reflex center. 
and they are going to cause those neurons to start releasing oxytocin. In our picture on 127, what we're saying is these neurons are then going to release, start to release oxytocin into the bloodstream. Now, when this first starts to happen, when this first starts to happen, about a couple of weeks usually before the birth of the baby, there's a few impulses going up and a little bit of oxytocin causing some slight contractions. The woman, especially if it's her first baby, will feel these. And she might even rush to the hospital saying, I think I'm in labor. And if she's that relaxed and calm, she's not yet in labor. <laughs> and they will monitor for a little bit, and then they'll send her home. And they will call those Hick, uh, Braxton Hicks contractions. Have you ever heard that term? Braxton Hicks. These are the early contractions that are going to start to build up, but this is way too soon yet. But here's what's going to start to happen and, and intensify as this gets closer and closer to the actual uh, birth. The, uh, the head of the baby is pushing down on the lower wall, activating nerve impulses that are sent up to the hypothalamus of the brain. These hypothalamic neurons release oxytocin from the neural hypothesis, and that oxytocin causes contractions of the uterus. The contractions usually begin at the top of the uterus and push down like a peristaltic wave. And that pushes the baby's more forcefully down. That's simply going to put greater pressure of the baby's head against the lower wall causing more impulses to be sent up to the hypothalamus, causing more release of oxytocin, which is going to cause a stronger contraction down, which is just going to put greater pressure on the lower wall of the uterus, which is going to send more impulses up to the hypothalamus, which is going to cause more release of oxytocin, which is going to cause a stronger contraction, which is just going to put more pressure on the lower wall of the uterus, which is going to send more impulses up to the hypothalamus, which is going to cause more release of oxytocin, which is going to cause a stronger contraction, which is going to... You see what's happening? What starts out as simple contractions 20 minutes apart start becoming stronger and stronger contractions 15 minutes apart. 12 minutes apart, 10 minutes apart, stronger contractions, five minutes apart, three minutes apart. The whole thing is intensifying because the more oxytocin that's released, the stronger the contraction, the more pressure that's pushed by the head of the baby against that lower wall, which just keeps intensifying. This is called a positive feedback loop or response. Now, you say, did you write that somewhere? Yes, at the bottom of the page. So at the bottom of the page, the positive feedback loop, the oxytocin increases the labor contractions. The la increased labor contraction increases the pressure of the baby's head on the cervix, the lower part of the uterus. That increases the number of impulses sent up to the hypothalamus, which causes the hypothalamic neurons to release more oxytocin which increases the labor contractions, which increases the pressure of the baby's head on the uh, uterus, the cervix, which increases the number of impulses. So if this thing just keeps getting more and more intense, and the contractions are just getting stronger and stronger and stronger in this loop, well, what turns this off? When the baby pops out. When the baby finally comes out, there's no more pressure against the lower wall. So all of a sudden, there's the signals going up, stop, and it stops releasing the oxytocin, and now it's over. So it's the birth of the baby that turns this off. So this is a positive feedback response. Now, we have said, um, we have said that uh, the oxytocin not only causes the uterus to contract in the way that we've described, we had said that the oxytocin will cause any fluid in the mammary glands to squirt out. So we might ask, well, if oxytocin is being released, then why isn't anything squirting out of the mammary glands of uh, the woman during childbirth? 
And the answer is, in most women, there's no fluid in the mammary glands yet. So there's nothing to squirt out. So you'd say, well, wait a second. So like, when does the milk come in? So let me explain here, and I wrote the terms down here on the lower left, that it takes basically uh, the first fluid starts to be produced in the mammary glands within one day after the birth of the baby. So usually within a matter of a few hours after the birth. Now some women might have some fluid, but not much. Basically they don't start to really produce any fluid, and, uh, any fluid at all. And the first fluid is this clear fluid called colostrum for the first day after the birth of the baby. Now colostrum is basically mostly just water. It's just some fluid, clear fluid. It's got a little bit of sugar, lactose sugar, not much, and some antibodies. That's about it. Not much nourishment. So uh, now, if the uh, a woman has just given birth, if she has her baby suckle or nurse on the breast, that's going to trigger some other hormones that we're going to get into called prolactin, and milk will start to be produced. But most of the time, that milk isn't going to be produced by the mammary glands for about three days after the birth of the baby. It takes about two to three to four days. We'll say three days after the birth of the baby before the milk really comes in. So in fact, for the first three days in a mother who's breastfeeding the baby, the baby actually loses weight. The baby will actually weigh less three days after it was born than at the time of birth because it loses weight for the first three days. Now once the milk comes in, in the mammary glands, human mother's milk is very rich. It is higher in sugars and fats than cow's milk. So it's very high in lactose, very high in fats as well as having calcium in it and uh, antibodies. I'm not trying to identify all the nutrients. But it's very high in sugar and fats. And once within about three days after the birth of the baby, the milk comes in, the baby starts gaining weight and getting chubby very quickly. But not for the first three days. So that's the timing of that. So, but the main point is, oxytocin would cause fluid to squirt out of the mammary glands, but there's not yet any fluid at the time of birth. Now, let's see what happens as far as how this all works. Now, you'll notice that, uh, first of all, at the top of this picture, <clears throat> at the top of the picture, here it shows these neurons in the hypothalamus uh, that release oxytocin uh, into the uh, bloodstream. And uh, you'll notice that they've labeled it just so you can see it. They've labeled this brain area the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus. As that, I said that, that that's the kind of jargon that's used. We're, we're calling it the parturition milk letdown reflex center, which I feel is more descriptive of what it does. It's involved in parturition, which you should know that word is the clinical word for childbirth, and it's involved in milk letdown. The, release of the milk from the uh, uh, breast. All right, we will, and we'll call it that instead of paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus. Now, uh, here we can see the baby suckling. So this is after the birth of the baby, and the baby is suckling on the breast. Now, incidentally, if a woman chooses to bottle feed her baby and not have the baby suckle, then there won't be milk produced. It's going to require suckling and nursing by the baby to stimulate production of milk. So if a woman immediately just says, I'm just using bottles, then it really doesn't produce. All right, so in the nipple, there are sensory neurons. And these sensory neurons are activated by the suckling action. And incidentally, it not only would work if uh, the baby, either the baby suckles or you use a breast pump. Same idea, you're stimulating. Now, where do these impulses go? And incidentally, you'll notice right below, it shows sensory neurons in the uterus. They are both, in both cases, sensory signals go from these uh, uh, pressure receptors in the wall of the uterus or pressure receptors in the nipple 
and they are sent up the spinal cord, up, 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 up to the paraventricular, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, we'll call it parturition milk let down reflex center in the hypothalamus of the brain. That causes these neurons to release oxytocin. Oxytocin in the bloodstream will cause whatever fluid is in the mammary glands at that moment to squirt out. That's called milk letdown. The first fluid that appears is that clear fluid called colostrum. Within three days, milk starts to be produced and that'll squirt out. Now here's an interesting question. If oxytocin is being released because of the baby suckling, that's what's triggering this. This is called a neuroendocrine reflex. If the baby suckling is triggering the release of oxytocin, didn't we say that oxytocin causes the uterus to contract? So here's my question. If the baby is suckling and that causes the release of oxytocin, yes, that will cause, let's say, milk to squirt out. Is the uterus also going to contract? Yes. yes. Every time the new mother, her baby uh, suckles, she will feel her uterus contract. She'll get cramping. Now, in fact, that's considered very desirable. Now, whatever benefits, whatever benefits nursing has on the baby, which it does, right? It's better for the baby to get uh, mother's milk than formula. And also, the nursing has an important benefit to the mother. Because since nurse, nursing or suckling causes the release of oxytocin, that will cause the, uh, her uterus to contract which will help return her uterus to her pre-pregnancy size. The uterus is really stretched out from the nine months that the baby was expanding and stretching that uterus, and it's also filled with a lot of fluid, a lot of blood, a lot of fluid. So this, every time the baby nurses, the mother will feel her uterus contract, and it, it contracts and squeezes fluid out the vaginal canal. That helps get rid of that excess fluid and return the uterus to its pre-pregnancy size. That's a benefit to the mother in terms that's created by the suckling action or nursing action. I don't know if this makes sense, but they will tell you to massage the uterus. Maybe it's that pressure. That's the pressure. Yeah. That's the pressure. Mm -hmm. You could do that if you're not having the baby suckle. Yes, you could apply pressure, and that's exactly the same thing. It's activating it that way. All right, now, uh, another thing we might just point out is we can see right here that it's, uh, it's what's written right here on the, this diagram is psychogenic stimuli. And we're thinking, what? I want to remind you, the hypothalamus of the brain is wired into the limbic system. We had seen that in our flow chart on page 108. Here's the hypothalamus. This control center is here. The limbic system is the center of emotions. Can everybody see there are arrows indicating nerve impulses can be sent from the limbic system, the center of emotions, affecting the hypothalamus. You might remember I uh, slammed a chair down to frighten you, and it made your heart speed up, right? We were showing emotions can affect the hypothalamus, and the hypothalamus controls your internal organs. So the emotional state can affect the release of oxytocin. So that starts to explain how it might be that, let's say, a woman who has a lot of fear, apprehension, let's say about childbirth or nursing, and it's certainly understandable that somebody might have some fear or apprehension about this, anxiety, but that might inhibit these neurons from releasing oxytocin and interfere with the initiation of childbirth or interfere with the milk letdown. On the other hand, it could be that other emotions might trigger the release of oxytocin. So an example of that is that it's very common for women who are nursing their baby, for example, that uh, of, they, don't even, they don't even have to hold the baby and have the baby start suckling. If they just pick up their baby, the milk starts to come out, starts to leak out when they just hold the baby because the mother is feeling nurturing feelings about the baby and her emotions about the baby are causing these neurons to release oxytocin, which causes the milk to come out. 
Or even some women will say, find, that if they just hear their baby cry, the milk starts to come out because they're anticipating since the baby's crying, it's time to nurse. And even before they've got picked up the baby, the milk is already leaking out. So this really, these things that commonly one experiences are really quite understandable physiologically. All we're saying is this control center is in your brain. And what you think and feel affects how your body works. So uh, it, it starts to really affect some women, just take it one step further, some women will report who are nursing their babies that if they leave their baby at home, right, somebody else is watching it, and they're just going to go to the market. And while they're shopping at the market, somebody else's baby starts crying. <laughs> they start, the milk starts coming out. Because the, just the sound of a baby crying is enough to trigger this. Because it's emotions. Because, and the emotions affect the release of these neurotransmitter hormones. All right, let's summarize this by looking on page 134A. So on 134A, 134A, oxytocin. So oxytocin is released from the neural hypothesis. And what causes it to be really, what, what are, I should say, what are its functions? Its functions. The functions of oxytocin is it causes labor contractions and it causes milk letdown during nursing. And what are the factors? What are the factors that stimulate the release of oxytocin? The head of the baby engaging, pushing down on the lower part of the uterus, or the baby suckling, nursing. That triggers that neuroendocrine reflex, where a sensory neuron, in both cases, sends a signal up to the uh, parturition milk letdown reflex center in the hypothalamus. And what would reduce, what would stop the release of oxytocin? As we've said, childbirth, when the baby pops out, that shuts off that mechanism. Or if you stop having the baby suckle, that's called weaning the baby. Because even women who are going to nurse their baby for the first few months, most women will for sure stop having the baby nurse by the time the baby starts to have its first teeth, which is around six months. So because basically, once they've got it, some teeth there, that's a whole different story of uh, nursing on the nipple.